uh, the re the recording will be on YouTube later in the week. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the April meeting of Portland Photographers Forum. Uh, I'm your president, Bob Bergstrom. Uh, tonight's featured speaker will be Maggie Stieber, uh, who is a documentary photographer, and she's coming to us from Miami. Um, our uh, member speaker for 15 minutes tonight is Ingrid Arnett. Ingrid, are you here? And do you want to start your screen share? I'm here, and yeah, I'll go ahead. And Ingrid, thank you for coming tonight and, and uh, talking to us and showing us some of your work. Well, thank you for inviting me to do that. Um, yeah, I think oh. I joined. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, we got your screen. We can see your screen. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think I joined PPF about just over a year ago. And um, so it's fun to reflect a little bit on how I got here. And uh, so thank you for that invitation. Um, and I, I just thought I'd share a little bit. For those of you who go to print shares, you've probably seen me there. Um, and I mostly talk about the ongoing um, 365 project that uh, turned into, I don't know, a multi-year project after all. Uh, that wasn't the intent, but that's what happened. And um, I kind of want to thank, I wanted to start by acknowledging my daughter who um, is on screen right now. That's her you're seeing in her marching band uniform. Um, and uh, she kind of was the one who nudged me when she started marching band and said, mom, I want you to be the band volunteer photographer. So I went full into that and it was super fun, really challenging actually, because you know, you're out in either midday bright sun that you can't hide from, uh, you know, or pouring rain or stadium lighting, all sorts of stuff. But I had a blast and um, really put my heart and soul into it because uh, for a parent to be able to do that for other parents and be able to capture our kids um you know just being kids being themselves in the you know in those moments that we don't don't often get to see of our family members when we're not with them uh it was really meaningful so i finished i still do that every year every fall and it's um if you know anything about it it's it's kind of a gauntlet but um <laughs> so the first year i finished that i looked kind of looked around and i was like well what am i going to do now and i to make a long story short i stumbled into uh the notion of a 365 project and um so that's more what I'm going to talk about tonight. And so um, what I wanted to do really was kind of reflect on on um, those the photos that I've taken and kind of the greater meaning that they have for me. So I'm going to get my screen just right so I can see you guys and click through the photos easily. So just in reflecting, um, when I committed to a 365 project, I'm a pretty stubborn person. And so for, for me, that meant every single day, I don't miss a day. You know, um, if you read about 365 projects, a lot of people say it's okay if you skip a day. And I don't really have any interest in, in that kind of, uh, you know, setting a goal and not achieving it. So I, I set out to, in fact, take a photo every day. And one of the key takeaways for me was that some of my favorite photos would have never happened if I didn't have to get out and take that photo. Um, so I'll just kind of click through some of the photos that I don't know, illuminate those those, you know, ideas like that for me. Um, uh, in addition to kind of just having the impulse, the need to get out and take that photo and having something great happen because of it. Uh, I I found that it was a great icebreaker. I met I met friends and took complete and, and took pictures of complete strangers. Um, and I found that it was just a great way to seek out activities and find places to go. Um, another concept that I think about when I think about my 365 project was was just to um, to bend, but don't break. So maybe you have ideas in your back pocket, um, you know, and some days they'll work out and some days, some days they won't. Maybe you don't have time, maybe it's the weather, whatever it is. But um, my, idea, my idea was just to kind of 
push myself outside of my comfort zone, you know, on some days and stretch. Um, and other days, just take it easy on myself and uh, just take a picture that I felt was pretty. Didn't always have to have an aha moment. I just had to get out and do it. Um, another takeaway that I had from that I have from this project is that really nothing is black and white. That something that applies to taking a picture one day doesn't apply to taking it might not be true the next day. So, um, you know, in sorting all that out, I really felt ultimately at some point along the way that I needed to have an oasis. And I think that was a critical part part of starting and completing or in my case, continuing a 365 project for this long. And that's having an oasis, having a safe place to go back to, to feel calm and relaxed where you know that the process can just take over because the place is just familiar to you. Um, another key thing for me was just taking the camera everywhere, whether it was errands, uh, you know, so if I see something, I'll just that I would stop and take the picture while I was out and about or even on family vacations, which is, you know, difficult. It, it's a photo vacation is different than a family vacation, but it's okay. <laughs> um, if I had to get my photo, then I had my camera with me. And then, you know, what I found that was really great about that was that if you're on something like a family vacation, or if you're just running errands, you might not have the tool that you would choose if you were going out to say, um, take a particular photo. Um, and what that did for me is that it helped me learn to to adapt. It helped me learn to be faster, uh, you know, if you're taking the photo on the run, or just to take the photo in my own way, maybe not worry about taking it the right way. Um, so ultimately, um, this, you know, the takeaways, kind of overarching takeaways for me are that something like a project like this are, are about being present. Um, they're about practicing gratitude, um, seeing things I never would have noticed before, and um, finding the, the beauty, you know, all around me, and always working to get better and strive to improve. So then I just wanted to share with you um, something else that kind of came, something a little bit more tangible that came out of this project. I was able to put a set of photos in the, the PPF drawer in the, uh, the Blue Sky Gallery this month and next month. So my, my photos in, that, in, the, uh, in the drawer have to do with some of the photos that I took along the way. And I called the collection seasons change and it's a compilation of photos that have a continuous thread for me throughout this but this uh i gathered them throughout the 365 project but they have a continuous thread um but overall to me they represent not only seasons changing but the process of learning about myself and the world around me and just having a lot of gratitude for the beauty and hope and connections that, that I have found right outside my door. And that's my, that's what I wanted to share with you. Uh, good. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if people have a question or comment. I just, that was very inspiring, Ingrid. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to start that myself. I liked what you said about being present and practicing gratitude. Um, I just, Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. It, and it, your it, images are beautiful also. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought, you know, with, with all of you, you probably have experienced a lot of the same kinds of thoughts when you're out taking photographs. So I hope it I hoped it would resonate. So I'm glad to hear yeah. that it did.
Yeah, this is uh, Don, and I was, I was curious uh, what um, ratio of pictures you uh, felt uh, were satisfying to you out of, out of your project. Oh, that's such a good question because, um, you know, I, I have a lot more notes on this project that I didn't go over with you right now. And one of them was that, yeah, some days the photos were bad. I don't know what the, res the ratio was, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I heard myself saying that once recently that I took a lot of bad photos, but I, I took a lot of good photos too. And I think more importantly, every photo is in service to the next one. So it's not ever really a bad photo. And some days it wasn't about taking a pretty photo. Sometimes it was about a technique. And I didn't really care if I walked away with a photo that was ever going to show anyone. I took a photo that helped me learn and progress. So no bad photos. Yeah, Ingrid, those are that's a beautiful series that you made with your project. Um, always interested in process. So did you... Uh, choose a time of day, uh, like early morning to get out and take your shots or did it vary? I know you got out and about from time to time to, to other locations, but for your regular sort of daily routine, what was that about? I mean, that that's a great question. I think that's critical. The answer to that question is critical to making a project like this work. To me, at least uh, at this point in my life, I don't, I don't think I could have taken a certain time of day. You know, this morning I took my photo uh, or today I took my photo this morning because I knew we'd be meeting tonight. Um, so sometimes I just adapt to what's mm -hmm. going on in my life. Right. Um, and you know what I have time for and whether it's close to home or not. So um, oh, the, the, it ran the gamut. Yeah. Flexibility yeah. is pretty key. Ingrid, I'd like to thank you for being a, a new photographer and being willing to not new, but newer and being willing to present in front of uh, a group of interested uh, photographers who have uh, less maybe and a lot more experience thank you it, it takes a little chutzpah to, <laughs> to do what you did and, uh, it, it's it's good for all of us thank you thank you yeah it's uh, for a I, newish photographer you have an excellent eye i thank believe thank you yeah it's good photos. for me you, you guys are good for me i learned from all of you and uh just being able to think gather my thoughts and share and learn from others and listen to others and see all of your work has been has been an important part of my progress too so and ingrid how many how many days are you up to now it's more than 365 yeah i don't know i started on january 10th of 2022 so it's over two years it's wow. about two years and three months or four months i have no idea i should have googled it before we you can google that <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> So I have, Ingrid, a, I have a very practical question too, Ingrid. Do you um, like leave one lens on for say a week, two weeks, three weeks, or most of the time? Or that's a good question. Talk a little I, bit about that. I, I think my husband would like me to put my lenses away a little bit more often. I've got lenses out all because <laughs> it's whatever I need to grab, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I just I just adapt. One day, like this morning, and yesterday. It, it was my long lens, but I think the day before that it was my uh, it was my 40 millimeter. So I kind of do it all, and that's kind of what I want. I wanted a combination of muscle memory and mu muscle confusion. Thank you, Ingrid. Mike here. Um, <clears throat> another process question: yeah. Do you download and work on a photo every day, or do you? save them in the camera and do it once a week or whatever you know it's kind of it's gotten hard to do it every day <laughs> but i try to do it as quickly as i can you know i don't like to go too many days because the longer you go the less you learn you know i'll look at it on the camera and i'm like i think there might be something there and i'll put it on the screen and it was like yeah it's there and then i print it and it's like no it's not there so you have to see the process through all the way to know if it was really there or not and then it also makes me better every time. The more I look at the the photos after the fact and work on them, you know, the better I am when I'm out with the camera again. I'm better at seeing things in the field, so to speak, because I've learned to see all those things, little things that kind of ruin a great shot for you. Ingrid, are you saying do you print your work too? I kind of batch print. I don't. I, I'm wow. not a techie person, so I'll so, sort of save them up, and um, I use a service. I send them out fairly frequently. Okay. Can I ask, do you 
do you post on Instagram or it's been a real killjoy for me lately and I've quit for a while. How, how do you feel about that? Um, I don't. I'm, uh, I'm, I knew from the beginning that I would be distracted by that. And I don't want kind of hollow compliments from anyone uh, that won't serve me in any way. And I knew I would be looking for that. And so I, right now I'm just looking to who I was yesterday, what photos I could take yesterday and what photos I want to take tomorrow, not anybody else. Well, great. Well, thank you, Ingrid, for, for your, your presentation. And if people would like to see more of Ingrid's prints, they're in the drawer, the PPF community drawer at Blue Sky Gallery, uh, what, April and May? Yep. April and May. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our, uh, our featured speaker, uh, Maggie Steeper. Maggie, are you here? Yes. Wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me let me let me read your introduction. Uh, uh, Maggie is an internationally known documentary photographer, photo editor, and educator. She has worked in seventy-two countries, and she specializes in telling the stories of underrepresented people. She has had her photo essays published in National Geographic magazine. And she published a book uh, about her humanistic documentation of Haiti called Dancing on Fire, Photographs from Haiti. Um, her, uh, she also uh, did a nine year project on her mother's uh, journey with memory loss, uh, which won a Webby Award. Uh, she has worked in her career as a picture editor for Associated Press as a photographer for Newsweek and as the director of photography at the Miami Herald. So Maggie, thank you for, for coming to speak with us tonight and uh, we will turn it over to you. Oh, well, hello everyone. And uh, uh, it's very nice to be here. And uh, it's been a crazy day because it's the last day for turning your tax things in <laughs> and I barely made it, but anyway. Um, those photographs that we just saw were lovely. I thought they were beautiful, really, really beautiful. And I loved how that lady, how that young lady saw things. And uh, I thought they were quite lovely. So my work, of course, is very different. Um, but I'm quite happy to be here and kind of e meet all of you. So can everybody hear me really well? Or yeah, we 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 uh, see your screen and uh, and we can hear you well. Okay, very good. Um, well, shall I begin? Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and start your screen share? Well, uh, I, we could do that, but um, should I tell you just a little bit how I got started with this, just for a few minutes? Yeah. Yeah. No, that would be fine. Go ahead. We I will stay out of the way. You're not in the way, Robert. <laughs> um, well, I hate to tell you, I've been a photo I've been photographing for 50 years and I'm still doing it. Um, my first job uh, after I graduated uh, was on a small paper in Galveston, Texas. I grew up in Austin, Texas. Uh, and when I went to, so I heard there was an opening uh, at this small paper. And so I'd never been to Galveston, but I drove down there and I went to this paper and I told the managing editor that I was there to apply for this. And he said, well, we're not hiring a woman for this job. And I, you couldn't say that today, but uh, I said, well, uh, is there some reason that you wouldn't hire a woman? And he said, well, you know, you would have to go during the evening to all of these small towns nearby to do the police reports. And we don't want to be, um, uh, we wouldn't want something to happen to you. And so I asked him to tell me a little bit about the job and he told me. And then, <clears throat> so I got up to leave. And when I got to the door, I turned around and I asked him what time he comes to work. And he said, nine in the morning, but why are you asking? And I said, uh, I was just curious. And uh, 
I'll see you in the morning. And I ran out and I went down to the proverbial coffee house, the coffee cafe where everybody goes to gossip and all of that. So I started asking everybody what uh, is going on in the city that the paper hasn't, uh, hasn't written about. And everybody started talking about this um, beautiful, very beautiful old building. It, there was a medical school there and there was this very beautiful old wooden uh, oval building that just had slats for windows. And so the, the teachers would show all these cadavers and they would open them up and to show you where everything was. And so I started interviewing some of the students, some of the teachers uh, and photographing them. And then I snuck in <laughs> to this beautiful building and it was toward the end of the day and it was lovely and all of this light stringing through and it was kind of haunted looking. So I photographed that. So I was staying with a friend who had a dark room and this was of course the days of, I don't know why I'm doing this, but anyway, the days of film. So I stayed up all night and I photographed, I, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't think of the word, but anyway, I, I developed the film and I made about 10 prints and I wrote a story and at nine o'clock the next morning I was at, that man's office and he said miss i told you we're not going to hire you and i said well before you throw me out i did a story that everybody is talking about in your town and you haven't done any story about it and so i did and would you at least look at this work so he looked at the pictures and he read the story and he looked up at me and he was shaking his head and i thought oh well i tried and he said you know what I'm going to hire you because neither he, they had two men in mind for the job. And he said, neither of those men would have gone to that, to that uh, trouble. And so I'd like to publish this. And I said, you can, if you hire me. <laughs> and so they did. And so for a year uh, I did that and it was very interesting. And I learned a lot but I'm not really a small town girl. So after a year, I went to New York to seek my fortune. And there I applied for a job as a photo editor at, uh, uh, oh, damn it. Anyway, I applied for it. And uh, they didn't have an opening, but they said that the next time that somebody left that they would interview me again. I had to go through five or six interviews. And so finally somebody, after three months, somebody left. And so they hired me and I was a photo editor. Uh, and you do many, many things when you work for Associated Press. So uh, I loved that. And I thought that's what I would always do. But then I started being very interested in this particular war that was being fought in Zimbabwe in Africa. So I went on my vacation there to see what that was like. And I decided that I would go and cover this war. This, it was a, a guerrilla war. So there were two armies, two guerrilla armies that were fighting uh, to try to drive out the white people because this was had been um, uh, ruled by the British. And so anyway, um, I, covered that until it was over. And then I went back to New York. And uh, in the meantime, when I left Associated Press, I had a boyfriend, I lived with him and I left him, I left my job. I didn't tell my mama, I'm an only child with an only parent. I didn't tell my mama what I was doing. Um, so I would have a friend in London send her letters. So I would write the letters and send them to my friend and she would mail them on because I couldn't tell my mother I was covering a war. I just, she would die. So anyway, but I learned a lot that way as well. And anyway, so on and so on. But I came back and I started freelancing and I found these funny little stories that like um, there was a there was a cat who did, uh, there was a magic shop and they had a cat who did card tricks. So I did a story on that and I sold it to um, one of those rags uh, that you, I can't remember what it's called now, but anyway, and they paid me really, really well. And they said, if you have any more little stories like this, we'd like to know. So then I found a 
a little um a man who had a store where he would um fix dolls and toys and he wore a uh, a doctor's uh uniform and he had a tele not a telescope but what is it that they listen to? Stethoscope. Thank you, stethoscope. Um, and so I did that story and they bought that. And then I did a story about a dog and I did the whole thing on my stomach so I could show from you know the dog's point of view of the world. And so I started doing that. And anyway, little by little, I started, um, I, I went to Cuba quite a bit to try to learn how to do, um, long-term um, sort of coverage on things. And that work is so bad, I never tell it, but I learned a lot. And then I started going to Haiti a lot uh, because I really missed Africa. So, uh, and Haiti really um, was where I kind of blossomed into this business. So uh, I've worked in Haiti over a 30 year period going back and forth and back and forth. Of course, I can't go now because it's just really dangerous. But I love that country. I learned how, I speak French because I studied French and I learned Haitian Creole, which I love. It's a great language. And um, so little by little, these things happen. And I went to National Geographic to show them that work. And they, they said, next time you go, come back and show us more. And so for five times, I would go back to National Geographic and uh, finally, they gave me my first um, my first job, and I did a story on Miami. And I didn't live I live in Miami now, but I didn't live there. And so they that was when we had really long long uh, time to do story. It was a six month story. Now you're lucky to get six weeks for a story. But um, and they loved that. And then they just started giving me all kinds of stories. And so I've done a lot of stories about culture, uh, history. I did a history on the African slave trade. Um, and just I've done 15 stories for National Geographic. And I love the science stories because my mother was a scientist. My father was also a scientist, but they divorced when I was six months old. So anyway, I'm kind of going all over the place. But this it's little by little sometimes in this business, but I've really been very fortunate. And I also teach workshops and that's how I know Dawn. And uh, she's wonderful. She's taken two of my workshops and uh, those are more kind of, it's not about uh, documentary photography. Photography is more about, it's, it's called the secret garden workshop. And it's, um, it's kind of, encourages people to be wild at heart and to do sort of whatever they feel that they wanted to do. And that's always a lot of fun. But anyway, uh, I've, uh, so I'm gonna, I guess I'll just show you what I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna show you three stories and very quickly, and I'm actually four things because all of this story that I've done, which is pretty much, um, you'll see. But in the fourth story, it's very different from what I've been doing. So I guess what I have to do is share the screen. So I'll do that. Okay, share. Okay, come on. Oh. Okay, and yeah, we can see your screen, so we're good. Oh dear. Okay, well here, I'll get rid of this and I can get rid of this. Do I need to get rid of this? I think you could just minimize it. I'll just do this. I'll just do it there. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to show you, okay, where is it? Now I can't find them. Oh, here. Okay, all right, oops. Don't peek. Okay. You can see everything? Yes? Yeah. Is okay. there a way to make that, that one larger, to make that one full screen? Let me see. If I don't know why it's not doing that. Um, hmm. Upper left-hand corner, there's a green button. Hit that button. Oh, you're so smart. Uh, okay. There you go. How's that? Is that better? 
Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you work in Haiti um, first. So I hope it doesn't upset anybody, but Haiti is a remarkable country. You wouldn't think so now if you listen to the news. Uh, it's very magical. People are very sweet. Uh, it's a very poor country. There's very wealthy people there too. And there's about five or six really wealthy family and they kind of run things, uh, but there's always been a lot of political calamity. So for 30 years, the Haiti was ruled by the Duvalier family. And um, finally, the it, there was Papa Doc and then he died and Baby Doc, his son took over, but he was a terrible president. He really just liked to ride motorcycles and drink and take drugs and everything. So finally he was coaxed out and um, and there was going to be some attempts to have a presidential election. And, but, um, so I went to Haiti and I started working and there was, after baby doc left, um, there was a lot of demonstrations. Uh, so I went to photograph up North where there was this very, uh, not, not a violent demonstration at all, but, so I was photographing this demonstration and suddenly all the people ran to this big warehouse because there was a lot of food aid, lots of food aid that was sent to Haiti, but it was never given to the people. So it was sold on the black market and people started trying to break into this warehouse. And I was photographing and this little boy was trying to steal a box of food from beneath this shutter. And then the army came and they started trying to fight everybody off, but people were so poor and they, they broke in and there were bags of rice and um, there were all kinds of things, you know, tins of oil and all kinds of things and people were fighting over them and the army just pulled back and let them go at it because the army people actually were quite often from the poor families. And so, this is but what was happening. And again, this is the days of film. So you just don't know what you're getting. And you, I just was shooting like a maniac. And I didn't know I had gotten this picture. And um, it won an award at World Press Photo. And that kind of put me on the map, so to speak. Um, so, let's see. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna, I don't know why this is not working. Um, but I also did a lot of work uh, with street kids because there were a lot of orphans or a family might have too many, too many children. And so they would, uh, the kids would go and stay on the street. And um, so I did a project on these two gangs and they're not gangs like bad gangs, they're little boys. And they would sleep in abandoned cars and on the street and things like that. So I started photographing them different ones. And this is a picture of some of the boys. And the, those little boys uh, not only taught me Creole, but uh, at one point I was in a very, very dangerous situation in which I was almost beheaded when at church I was photographing this priest who was very, very um, beloved by the poor people. And a gang of men uh, came into the church and started shooting people and clubbing people and mach with machetes and everything. And I was caught by a man and he, he had me by the shoulder and he, he um, swung the machete and I ducked and then he raised it to swing again and I, and I managed to get away from him. And I, happily I was wearing an old dress that day and he lost the, his, he had me by the shoulder, but he lost it and he kept the dress, which tore all the way down to my uh, back. I mean, to my waist, but you know, love those old dresses because I that one saved me and I managed to escape. But many, many people were killed that day. But these little boys came in later and they saved me. They took me out uh, on a way that, so the street kids were really quite wonderful. So I also, you couldn't do this now, but I used to walk through the slums and I used Leica's, uh, the, the small range finders and um, 
I carry very little equipment because these are poor people and you don't really, you know, want to walk around like a camera shop because these are people who haven't eaten or anything like that. But I think they all thought I was a nun or something, but um, I would talk to people. And so I happened to be trying to figure out what this, this wall was with the heart on it. And this gentleman stopped and I started talking with him and I asked him what this was and it had been where there was water that everybody could take back home for free, but it broke. And so they, the, the government never came to repair it. And so he was telling me how very difficult life was and he started weeping and I just took the camera up and took one picture and I call this broken heart um, palm. Yeah. Um, and this is these are people who go to the top of a mountain every day at dawn to pray, to be closer to God and to pray. And so I had seen these people on, uh, when I would be driving north to go to another city, um, I would see these people on the top of this mountain. And so one day I decided I wanted to go up on the mountain to see what these people were doing. And I climbed up this mountain, it wasn't easy. <clears throat> and um, and I waited and nobody was there. And I thought, I guess nobody's coming, but little by little people started coming. And in these situations, you don't start photographing, you let people get used to you. And I just sat there and finally the minister came and I told him what I was doing and would it be all right if I stayed and could I photograph? And again, have, speaking Creole, because these are country people, they don't speak French or English, but I speak Creole and hallelujah for that. Um, and so he said, yes, you're welcome. So this is um, what that picture is about. So this is, I'm kind of going backwards here, but this is the day that Duvalier, um, baby doc left the country and little by little people came out, the wealthy people, the poor people, they all came out to celebrate and dance and sing because uh, Baby Duck had been a terrible president and, and ruthless. So I loved that everybody was so, you know, the rich people were dancing with the poor people and this is not something you see very often. And I, this is a picture I got and I thought it was really, when I saw it again, these are the days of film. And when I saw this picture, I was, I thought, oh, this is very interesting because if you see the shadow that looks like it's pinching his belly button, well, in Haiti, and this is true in Africa quite often, when a baby is born in a small village, uh, the umbilical cord is buried there and that's where you have to go when it's time to die. So I was hoping that when I saw this picture, I was hoping that that man didn't die. And then all of the secret police were put on trial they killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It was very cruel. Um, and so this was a trial for one of the, what was called the Tonto Makut, which is the secret police. And, uh, and the man standing up declared that his, um, that the Tonto Makut was, was not guilty of this. And everybody in the courtroom went crazy. And so that was interesting. And then there was an attempt to have the first elections in 30 years uh, for a new president. But then there started to be a lot of violence because the secret police and the army didn't want there to be a proper election. And so they would, you know, do blockades and set things on fire. And one night, uh, one night during this period, everybody was uh, hitting pans and pots to sort of make it known that they wanted this uh, election to go on. But then there started to be shooting all night long. And the next morning, uh, I and some other journalists went out and to there were bodies everywhere. And this one Haitian man said, you have to come, come with me, you have to see something. And so he took me and another photographer and we, to this to one of the slums and showed us this gentleman who had been caught, killed and his body had been placed 
uh, along a well-traveled pathway in one of the slums and uh, as I call it, the dead blue man. Um, so I'm going kind of all over the place. And then that election didn't happen. And then there was another attempt at elections. And again, many, many people were killed. Um, it was almost impossible to have proper elections. And so many, many people were killed. And so these are things you have to photograph. And I, I, uh, went to this church where there were five funerals going on. Funerals would meet funerals at the churches and there would be five at a time going on. And so I sat down next to this family and I asked them what had happened and their mother had gone to vote to change things and she was, she was killed at the polling station. And uh, so they were going to bury her in the National Cemetery. So I asked if I could go with them and again in Creole. And they said, yes. And so we walked because the National Cemetery wasn't too far from the church. And we walked and they took their mother's body and they put it into a crypt because in Haiti, uh, a lot of Haiti is below sea level. So they bury people in crypts that are packed on top of each other. And when they put the body in and then they covered it, the opening with cement and her son in this last moment just rose up in this last cry and I got this picture. And everybody left and I stayed and I just sat down and I wept because I had seen so much misery, so much death, so much violence and uh it seems like every time i would go to haiti at some point i would have a day of weeping just because you you just see some really harsh things and these people are so sweet and uh just trying to make a living so it's it takes something out of you sometimes and i was driving down by the harbor one day and there was a big bunch of people. And whenever you see a big bunch of people, you've got to stop and find out what's going on. So I went down and I was asking the people what's going on. And they said, well, some robbers uh, were robbing somebody and the police started coming. So the two robbers, robbers um, ran and jumped in to the bay. And then the police went out in a little boat. You can see it way in, in the background. And so this first robber, came walking in and you can see he was um, had his hands up. And when his foot touched the shore out of the corner of my eye, I saw a rifle come up and he was shot then and there. And that's how justice was meted out. And, and um, this was again uh, during, so anyway, all of the elections were canceled. And then there was an, another attempt to have an election and there was uh, a university professor and he was kind of backed by the army and all of the Haitian people thought that uh, it was all decided already, even if there were elections that he would be the president. And they were so angry, they set downtown Port-au-Prince on fire. And this is him, Leslie Maniga. And I followed him a lot through his uh, campaign and I made this little book for him not that I was a fan of his, but I had I had an idea that if I would make him a little book, if he if he won. So I went uh, back to Haiti and I gave him this book. And the day that he was inaugurated, I was the only <laughs> I was the only journalist allowed in the palace because I had given him this book. So sometimes you have to do those things, but it was still Haiti under the gun. And then uh, many, many years later, there was um, there were so many leaders and it's very corrupt. The government is always very corrupt. And so many, many years later, this priest who had the church where I was almost beheaded uh, decided he left the priesthood and he decided to run for president. And people lined up to vote well into the night and men in cars 
would drive by and shoot at people and it was it was still very violent but they they spent all night voting and this is uh Aristide who was a priest and he was elected and so um he called me because I knew him because I had been doing this story on him and on his church and he called me and he asked me if I would do the um what is it called the formal um portrait of him so the thing is that he's little he's little I could throw him over my shoulder but not that I would but anyway he was very short so they couldn't find a, a flag of the nation that was low enough so I put him on top of these uh, bags of paper and uh, the of course and I just thought it was such a funny picture I took it but this was not the formal picture it was much tighter but I I thought this was funny and when it was announced that he was elected everybody came out and uh, except the wealthy people who were terrified of him uh, but he had the hearts and minds of so many people in the slums. And so they came out to celebrate. And so there were also times that were very peaceful and I thought it was really so important to photograph uh, when it was calm and so that people, I could show that people had lives like you and I, so to speak. And this is a Saturday morning in one of the, the Bidonville, the slums. And so I, I thought I have to do more to do justice to Haiti, I have to show the beauty of it and and just the normality of things sometimes. And they say that the real Haiti is found in the countryside, and I think that's true. And so I did a lot of <clears throat> working or photographing of farmers, and this was at the end of, the, of a day when people get together and gossip and talk and everything. And people are very nice, you know, they're, they're really very sweet and, oh, sorry about that. Um, and then I did a story for a week. I wanted to do a story about life in a Haitian village. And I'm sorry about those things. But anyway, and so this lady who was a farmer's wife came to me and asked if I would do a portrait of her and her family because they can't afford to go to a studio to be photographed. And I said, yes, I, I would love to do that. And so she ran home to get her children. <clears throat> and so I kind of made a fuss over them, you know, like, and I put this beautiful flower on her chest and I started photographing her. And when I turned around, the whole village had lined up and they all wanted to be photographed. And we had so much fun and I photographed everybody. And then <clears throat> I went back to New York. And after a little while, I went back to, to Haiti and I drove down to the little village. And when people saw my little car, they came running from the fields and running out of the houses. And I started handing it. I made prints, eight by 10 prints for everybody. And everybody, I started handing them out and people were, they couldn't believe that, oh, this is not me. Or, and people would say, it's you, it's you. And some people were laughing, some people were crying. And it was, it was an amazing day. And that night they killed a pig, sorry. They killed a pig. Now the pig is the farmer's piggy bank because it has babies and then they can sell the babies and they get money to buy a new roof or to pay for medicine for their children or their wife or to send their kids to school. And I think it was the first time I actually truly realized how significant a photograph can be. And I have to say that I learned lessons, a lot of life lessons in Haiti. And, uh, but it was so wonderful. And here's just some more farmers and these were places that they lived in. And so I was out uh, in this very dry area one day and I was trying to find a picture and there was nothing to photograph because it, you could see there's a lot of deforestation and also this was below the sea level. So it was just very dry and everything. And I thought, I'm sure there's a picture here, but I'm not seeing it. And suddenly I heard somebody singing behind me and it was this little girl and she was singing and dancing. And so I, I talked to her and I asked her why she was so happy. And she said it was her birthday and her mother had bought her this dress. Now in Haiti, a lot of clothes from the US are sent to Haiti. It's called Pepe. 
and you can go to the market and maybe you find a dress for 25 cents or some trousers or something. And so she said, I love to sing and dance. And I asked her if I could photograph her doing that. And, and she said, yes, I always ask if I can. Um, but I love that. And um, I was in the countryside again and I went to a market, an outdoor market where people were selling all kinds of things. And I really love bright, colorful plastic things. I'm just drawn to them. So I was photographing uh, all of these things that were the items that were sent to Haiti. Uh, and Haiti is a marketplace for a lot of countries. And so I was trying to make a picture that was kind of interesting. And I realized that there were people passing by and they were being reflected in the mirror. And I took this picture and I really liked it because the people are sort of in the middle and all of the things around them are things that they have to buy. Oh, I'm so sorry about this. But anyway, so then I started hanging around with voodoo priests and uh, trying to learn about voodoo. And there were a lot of um, temples to voodoo. And a lot of people have a very, um, I think, people misunderstood voodoo. I think they, a lot of people, a lot of ministers um, from outside uh, and well-meaning church people um, think of, that it's the devil, the worship of the devil. But in fact, there's two sides of voodoo and one of them is very beautiful. They believe in God uh, and Christ and others do practice a darker voodoo, but um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of religious figures. So if you're looking at this, it's, uh, it's like the Holy Virgin, but she's known as one of the goddesses of love, Erzuli. And so a lot of these things are painted on inside the voodoo temples. And also in the cemeteries on Fridays and Saturdays, there are voodoo ceremonies and every, every cemetery has a big cross. And that's where they have these uh, voodoo ceremonies. And so <laughs> I was, and again, you don't start photographing. You just, so I stood there and finally the voodoo priest kind of nodded at me and I started photographing. And so after the ceremony, everybody left except for the priest, the voodoo priest. And he came over to me and he was a little bit drunk because voodoo has a lot of liquor going on. And he took me into his arms and he started dancing me around the cross. And then he stopped all of a sudden. And I would always wear these little cotton shirts. It's so hot there. And I would always keep a couple of dollars in my, in my pocket and uh, my shirt pocket. And he, I don't know how he knew that that was something there, but he pulled the pocket open and he took the dollars and he tipped his hat and he disappeared like that. So uh, he got $2 and I got to dance with uh, him. So, and this is again, I don't know why this is happening. I'm so sorry. Um, and this is a voodoo ceremony. Again, you don't just go in, you have to be invited. And that's why I tried to get to know a lot of the voodoo people so I could go in and photograph. And then, I don't know why this is happening. Um, anyway, in 2010, there was a terrible earthquake in Haiti and thousands and thousands of people were killed. And this is downtown Port-au-Prince and so much of it was destroyed. And the downtown really had so much of the history of Haiti and um, just so many people were killed. And this is people trying to find whatever they could to try to sell or to rebuild their homes. And sometimes there, people would go on at the end of the week to a lot of uh, places where garbage is dumped and to go through it to see what they might find. And uh, they would even fight over things sometimes. And this is a man who was trying to drag a big, uh, piece of wood to rebuild his house. And again, this is downtown after the earthquake. And it took five years. People were living in tents. And for five years, they were living in tents. It was tents. It was terrible. 
And this was the palace, which was so beautiful. And it just, it was like a wedding cake and it just imploded on itself after the earthquake. Okay, so I'm gonna do something here because I'm thinking that's better. Okay, is that better? You can see it? Sorry. Yeah, that, that's now it's full screen. Yes, I'm so sorry. Duh. Okay, I've had a really tough day today. Okay, taxes. But anyway, so uh, my mother Madge uh, was quite brilliant and she was very eccentric. And um, uh, at some point, so I am... Um, uh, if we move forward, I I lived with my boyfriend for quite some time, 28 years. We broke up several times, and then the last time was horrible. I'm not going to go into that, but I just really wanted so badly to leave New York City. I had lived there for a long time, and I just hit a wall, and I was trying to figure out what to do. And the phone rang, and it was the Miami Herald. And they were looking for a director of photography and somebody who knew me well said, you should call her because she's been a direct, she's been a photo editor and she's a photographer. And so anyway, uh, I took the job and they, I mean, they hired me. And so I was in Miami and my mother was still in Austin. So I made an agreement with them that every month I would get a, a week to go home to visit my mother. And I, as long as I could, I kept her at home. But finally one day she had a, an episode because she was falling into memory loss. And I had this big poster telling her, uh, saying, you know, writing, this is my phone number. If you get scared, call 911. And she called 911 and the police came and they took her to a hospital and they called me and said I had to come or they were going to have me arrested. And I had just been there. So I flew right away. <clears throat> anyway, so this is Madge. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's my mama. She was half Cherokee. And um, those are family photos. And this is her. I found, I looked at 50 places because I traveled for my work. Well, I left the Herald after four years. I loved it, but I missed being out. And so I knew I was gonna have to bring my mother over. And I looked at 50 places in three counties. And sometimes after I would take the tour, I would go to my car and just weep. But um, I found a really great place and my mother blossomed. She was very, very reclusive and she blossomed and she really was happier and she was doing much better. And it was a great place because they would give her breakfast in bed whenever she woke up. It was a great place. And the and it wasn't, it was affordable for me. I could afford, it was $1,500 for a private room, which is unheard of uh, nowadays. But, um, and the caregivers were <clears throat> wonderful. They would dress everybody up every day. And uh, it was wonderful. And this was one of her birthdays and she was very happy. And, I would bring her home on weekends uh, and I decided I wanted to do a portrait of her and this is a portrait of her. And then I don't know why I asked her to do this, but because my mother was very prim and proper and I asked her if she would take her dress off. I don't know why I asked her this, but she did. She stood up and she took it off and she was naked and she sat back down and I took a picture. I never show that picture to anybody. I will never show it. But I wanted a picture of the vessel that brought me into this world. And it's a beautiful picture, but only I will ever see it. And the most wonderful thing happened um, was that she decided she wanted to be sexy. So uh, I went out and I bought some black hose and black panties and black bra. And when she wanted to, when she felt like she wanted to be sexy, we would dress her up. The caregiver, her the best caregiver, who was wonderful and adopted my mother. And anyway, but, and she would walk around real sexy like that. And it was so cute and and so wonderful to see because my mother was very proper and, 
but it was so wonderful to see this. This was a tough day. And this is Mina Dora, she's Romanian, and she took care of my mother. If my mother was not, you know, if she was upset at night and she wasn't sleeping and, you know, people with dementia have good days and bad days. And, um, and Mina Dora would sleep with her at night just to keep her calm. And she, she was like another daughter to my mother and she became like a sister to me. She was a godsend. This was another bad day. I photographed my mother during this period because this melancholy voyage uh, of dementia. And I photographed her because I had no family. This was my family. And I have to say photographing her and getting to see her through the camera saved me because it's, you can imagine, this is my family and so it helped me to photograph her. It really helped me. So she fell and broke one hip and that got fixed. And then another hip, she fell again and another hip was fractured. So I was taking her back to the doctor after surgery just to make sure she was okay. And after that, she couldn't walk. So she was in a, a wheelchair and this was a beautiful garden at this uh, home. And again, some days were good days, some were bad. But what was great about this place is they had cats and she loved cats. So that was very nice too. And one day I was, uh, it had rained. And so I decided to take her on a little walk. Um, and we came to this puddle and I, as often as I can, I try to make pictures that are metaphors for other things. And when I saw this puddle, I thought those trees, so this is um, a reflection. And the trees I thought of as being the memory that she still has, but the puddle where there's nothing is everything that she's forgotten. And, and this is Mina Dora. And at lunch, they would dance. All the caregivers would dance and kind of entertain people. And that's Madge on the left. <clears throat> This is my favorite picture of my mama because I think she's so beautiful here. And she was napping and I got up on the bed and I photographed it. And I think she looks so indigenous, you know, she looks like she's Indian and she always had a little stuffed kitty. I love this picture. And anyway, time passed and time passed and we were celebrating her birthday in her room and uh, she suddenly sl slumped over and I had signed her up for hospice. Um, and so we called a doctor and a doctor came uh, with a nurse and he said, well, uh, I think uh, you should stay with her as much as you can now. I wouldn't leave. And he, he said, do you wanna take her to the hospital? And my mother, hated hospitals. And I said, no, uh, no, we'll keep them here. But we had a full-time nurse there from hospice. And <clears throat> about four days later, and I didn't leave. I slept, I slept there. I didn't go home at all. And I, um, there's this terrible thing. I don't know if you know about it, but it's called the death rattle. And it comes very close. It, it, it precedes it's it's kind of a sign that death is just nearby. And she started gasping and it was horrible. And so for, and I, I was, I would could give her some morphine and I didn't let the nurse give it to her because sometimes they try to, I hate to say it, but they tried to hasten death by giving them a little bit too much morphine. So I said, no, I will do it. And, um, and so I just held her like she was my baby and I talked to her and and for three hours she struggled and then she took her last, her last breath. And so the nurse and I washed her and I had bought this beautiful dress for her just for this occasion. I know that sounds terrible, but I wanted her to be beautiful. And so we dressed her and we put little roses and flowers all around her. 
And when everybody came to work, they all came up. These are the caregivers uh, to say goodbye. And, um, and so I was going to have her cremated and uh, the people came uh, to take her away. And when they came in, uh, they said, we've never seen anybody so beautiful. This woman was really well loved. And she was, she was well loved. Um, and I have to say that from the time I was five and I knew one day my mama would pass, would die. And I so wanted to be there. I wanted to be there so badly and I was there. And it was a gift to be there. It was so important to me. And it was it was just a wonderful gift. And, and uh, so the, cremation people came in and they said, we've never seen anybody so beautiful and we're gonna take good care of your mother. And after a couple of days, if you want to come and see her one more time, you may do that. So I did, and uh, not to get too graphic about things, but sometimes when people die, they, their mouths are open and their jaws are stuck and they had closed her mouth I guess they sewed it close and they had closed her eyes and sewed them and she was beautiful. It wasn't this sort of sometimes grotesque looking thing and uh, and she was beautiful. And anyway, um, so I have her ashes and I don't know if you can see this little thing behind me where I'm pointing. I have her ashes there in a very beautiful jar that you can see through and I decorate it uh, for different holidays. And I know this is gonna sound crazy, but sometimes I take it out in the sunlight so she can see the sunlight and hear the birds singing. When I was a little girl at five, my mother always told me, she said, I want you to go out and listen to the birds in the morning because they have, they have some messages for you. And then I want you to touch the ground. So I did that every day that the weather would allow. And by the when I was 10, I said, Mama, I don't, what are the messages? I don't understand what the birds are saying. And she said, they're reminding you that they are still there and that we as indigenous people are still here. And I want you to touch the ground so that the mother, mother nature knows that you love her. And I love this and I do it every day To, I still do this every day. And it makes me feel so close to her. So on the basis of that story, National Geographic gave me a story on face transplants. And this is Katie. She was gorgeous and a straight A, uh, straight A student. And um, she was a very good girl. And she had a boyfriend and I guess he convinced her to do something that um, that was against her upbringing. Uh, and then the next day he dumped her. And of course she was broken hearted because teenagers, you know, they're, they're so easily wounded. And so Katie um, went and got her brother's rifle and tried to commit suicide with it. And she didn't kill herself, but she blew off her face and it was just hanging there. And so it was a miracle that she, she this is for National Geographic. And we got, um, we were the only people allowed to do this story. And, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, uh, so they, her mouth was like this. She didn't have a chin. They took, uh, they took some flesh from her stomach and from her thighs and they did their best, the doctors did their best to make um, to make a face and she had no nose. So she had to be, breathe through um, a hole in her neck and her nose was like a little bent elephant tusk. I mean, elephant, I can't think of the word, but you know, the trunk, uh, anyway, the trunk, but, this was the cover of National Geographic magazine when we finally, we worked on this story for three years and I would go back and forth and back and forth. I got very close with the family and with Katie 
and they were so loving uh, because every time I would go there, I would always do a portrait of Katie with flowers in case she never got a face that maybe she would at least have something beautiful. And so this is the first day that I met Katie. She was in the hospital and that's her mama. And she had just had this terrible operation to put these screws in her uh, cheeks to, and every day the screws were turned uh, to bring her structure, her bone structure a little tighter so that if she got a face, there would be some support. And this is it. And it was very painful. And she had to wear that for about a month. And you can see what happened. This is, I mean, this is what she looked like. So she finally got out of the hospital. And so it was a spring day and we went to the, the park and they were so, <clears throat> they were so exhausted. And they kind of fell asleep and I was with them and that was nice. And Katie never gets to be alone at all. So she can't see very well. She can see light and shadow, but she can't see. She'll never see again, actually, sadly. But she never got to be alone. And so there was this beautiful little lake in this park and she got to have some alone time. And I thought that was important to photograph. This is her brother and he felt terrible because it was his rifle, um, <clears throat> which shouldn't have been loaded, but he always felt guilty. Everybody in the family, had to go to therapy because you can imagine why. And so she started learning uh, Braille in case she, well, she was never gonna see again. So she couldn't read anymore. And this is a young lady who was teaching her Braille. And one evening, um, Kay was in terrible pain. And uh, so she couldn't swallow all the pills. Her She had to take like 15 or 20 pills a day so she had a hole in the side of her over here and they would stuff the pills in there. And finally we had to take her to the hospital because she was in such pain. And I would always take them out to a three or four nice dinners when I was there. And, and the magazine was very good, they said, because we have, a, we, we have um, a budget that we have to stick to, but they, they said, if you go over budget for this, it's okay. So I would always take them out to a really nice dinner, but the mama would have to feed her because the food would just fall out of her face. And finally they took out that horrible thing. And this is in the hospital and that's her mother. And one day we just took a walk. It was autumn. And then she got to meet two people who had had face transplants. These were two people. This was at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. That's where they were. And they, they lived in the uh, Ronald McDonald house. And both of her parents had been teachers, but they had to stop teaching and they had to be the caregivers. And so she got to meet these two people who had had uh, face transplants and they, they just embraced her and tried to tell her, you know, what, what it was like and things like that. And she also had to stay very, very strong. So she would have to go do some exercising. And they had one of these um, bicycles that you could, you know, that was stationary. And this is her mother uh, watching Katie exercise. And so I stayed in this really beautiful old hotel that was very famous. And they had a beautiful, beautiful room for parties and dinners and things. And I was setting up my lights to do a portrait of her and her father and her started dancing and singing to each other. And I shot a video of this as well, a video, and it was so lovely. And it, it gave me an occasion to make a photograph that was uplifting and loving, you know, and not just all of this, sadness and kind of horror. And finally, um, there were three or four times when it looked like there would be a face that would be donated, but it had to be the same race, the same uh, age, more or less. There could be no diseases by the person who was dying. And it was really hard. So they had four 
possibilities, but there was always a problem. And finally, um, this grandmother, Sandra, um, had a granddaughter and that was her family. And her granddaughter overdosed on drugs and she was brain dead. And so the grandmother said, I don't wanna keep her alive because she'll never wake up again. And so the doctors talked to her and asked if she would be willing to donate this face of her granddaughter. And she said, yes, yes, I think it's a great idea. And she donated her granddaughter's face to Katie. And I went to see her the day before she was gonna go meet Katie. She was gonna go and meet Katie so she could see Katie and meet Katie and see the face. And she was bringing out all of these pictures of her granddaughter and she was weeping a little bit. And it was, she was a wonderful woman. And this is Audra who, who died and whose face went to Katie. And these are a few of her uh, doctors. She had a team of 25 doctors. And every other Monday night, they would go to the cadaver lab. And I love to go to the cadaver lab. But I couldn't put, well, I, to photograph, just to photograph the doctors. Um, and Katie got the face. And they literally sewed it on like this. And you could see the stitches. And <clears throat> she was in the hospital of course. And this was a moment where she just, everybody was, she was always surrounded by people. And, but here was a moment where she could just be by herself. And this is when she was having the stick, the stitches taken out, but look, she has a beautiful new face. And she was crying because it, she was scared and she was calling for her mama and it hurt a little bit, but she got a new face. And this was her with her, the people who would come just to exercise her because she needed to exercise. So she, they would dress her up and they would walk around. And sometimes those two young ladies would sing with Katie. And this is Sandra meeting Katie for the first time. And it was a really moving moment, as you can imagine. And so came time for us to finish the story. And I was trying to think, how do you make a picture that ends this story? And the thing that I really felt about these parents, they were amazing. And in, um, in a lot of indigenous beliefs, when we see eagles flying overhead, those are the ancestors and they're watching over us. And I felt so much like her two parents were like the eagles flying over their baby, their daughter, to protect her and I and so it was my last visit to them and I said I want to take a picture where you're caressing Katie and so I had them lay on a bed and I just set up a couple of lights and I got up on the bed and I stood over them and this was the picture that ended the story and it was in the magazine and with that story we were Pul Pulitzer Prize finalists and uh, there's only three finalists each year. So that was pretty good. But I love this picture because it reminds me so much of what her parents did for her and how they stayed by her and how they were eagles flying overhead and protecting their baby. So that's uh, if, I don't know if you want to see something more, but there is one more thing that I could show you or maybe you have some, and it's completely different from this, very different. So I would like to show you that now. Sure, why don't you go ahead? Okay, I'll go fast. Now, how do I do this? I, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm ready to change. Okay, how do I close this? Oh, duh, maybe I can, okay, I don't know how to close this. For some reason, can I do that? No. Uh, how can I do this? Let's see. Okay, good. Okay. Whew. All right. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Secret garden. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so I photographed a lot of difficult things and um, wonderful things, 
And at some point I started making these pictures that when I first started taking pictures, I would make these kind of spooky pictures and kind of funky pictures. And my teacher said, if that's what you're going to do, you'll never make a living. And I said, okay, I'll get serious. And, uh, but about maybe eight or 10 years ago, I just started making these pictures that I, I, I just, whatever uh, something moved me, I would photograph it. And I decided this is a secret garden and, and Lily La Palma is my alter ego. And I did a lot of work on this and a friend uh, coaxed me to apply for a Guggenheim Foundation grant. And I thought, oh, they'll never, they'll never give me a grant for this, but they did. And when you apply for a grant, uh, you don't have to, with the Guggenheim, so, um, you don't have to make a budget. You just, they just ask you how much money do you want? And I thought, well, if I could get $25,000, I'd be really happy. And they gave me $60,000. And uh, my, I had to write a proposal and it was very, very personal. And I think that made a big difference. And I sent some of these pictures in. So I'm gonna show you this. Now, let's see, I, how do I do the full screen now? <laughs> I said, oh, yes, it, what was it? The green one, okay, green. So, yeah, okay, there you go, sorry. I should know these things, but my head's kind of crazy because of the tax thing. It was right up to the last minute. Anyway, so whenever it, it suits me, I photograph, and this is a little Haitian boy, but um, this is the saint. And I thought he was so beautiful. And I just thought of him as a little saint. And I sometimes take the pictures uh, through a tintype app and it looks makes things look very old and kind of beautiful. So this is the saint. And this is, so I grew up by myself and I was an avid reader as a child. And I started reading Shakespeare very early on. And uh, I loved Hamlet, uh, but I was very mad at, Oh, of Ophelia, who drowned herself. And I was so mad at her. And so I was teaching a workshop in Tennessee uh, with some uh, young people. And at the end of the class one day, they said, Maggie, we're going to go swimming in the lake. Do you want to come with us? And I said, well, yeah, but I don't have a swimsuit. And they said, we don't either. And I said, well, I'm not swimming naked in, <laughs> in front of my students. And they said, we'll just swim in our clothes. And so... This young lady jumped in and I thought, oh my God, it's Ophelia, it's Ophelia. And this is called Missing Heaven. So I really, I'm not a religious person, really. I'm spiritual, if you can understand the difference, but um, uh, but I always loved the, the Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh, I, she's so simple, you know, all of the Virgens, the virgins are always have crowns and fancy dresses and everything, but but she's so simple and so lovely. And so I was teaching a workshop in uh, in Mexico, in Mexico City, and this was my assistant. And so I said, I want to make my version of the Holy Virgin, and I bought these flowers. And so this is the Holy Virgin. Um, I also did a story on memory. Uh, for National Geographic. And um, I had met this lady uh, when I went to photograph her for a German photograph uh, magazine, and she was Cuban. And she left Cuba as a child. And while we were talking, um, I asked her if she had gone back to Cuba. And she said, I will never go back to Cuba until Fidel Castro was dead. But every day I swim in the waters. She lived in Miami. I swim in the waters because the waters that lap the shore of Miami also lap the shores of my of Cuba. And it's like swimming in a sea of memory. And I never forgot that. And so when I got this assignment um, on memory, I called her and asked if she really does that every day. And she said, every day that the weather allows. And I asked if I could go out with her one morning to photograph her. So we went out into the ocean and I have this big camera that shoots this size 
of um, film and I could hold it over my head. And so I photographed this and this was the, the photograph that opened our story on memory. I just loved what she said about that. This is a sacred heart of an innocent boy and it kind of references children who have been molested. And I like to think that they're not ruined, that they're, they're sacred in a way. And this is the horned man and that's in Mexico. Oh, and so I, I um, so if you will recall the Me Too movement and suddenly all men were terrible and I, I know a lot of really nice men. And so I started photographing men with flowers to celebrate the, the nice men and the men who support us, who encourage us, who respect us. And I have a lot of friends, male friends, uh, both older and, and younger. Uh, and so those that I think fit that, um, I photograph, but I've never photographed. This is a, a friend who allowed me to photograph him naked, but I didn't want to see his little part. So I just had him do that. So men with flowers, and it's still part of the secret garden. And this is also a man born from blossoms. And this is a young man that I've mentored before. He's uh, from uh, Europe, but he, his father was from Congo in Africa. And if I had a son, Leonard, this is his name is Leonard. If I had a son, I would want him to be just like Leonard. He's just the most lovely person I've ever known. And he's a photographer too. So I coaxed him to let me, you know, for him to float in the water and I surrounded him with flowers. This is called Tragedie Tropicale. It's a tro tropical tragedy and it's about Haiti, that it started out so well and it's just tragic what's happened to that country. And this is the tears of a young demon. And this is also a man. Everybody thinks it's a woman, but um, it's a man. And uh, I know him and he's really great, but he plays in a band and he has dreadlocks. And anyway, that's him. This is the missing father. So my that's my father when he was in university and he would write letters, but I would write back, but he, he would always write the same letter again and again, but um, so that's the missing father. And this is longing. And this is the woeful tale of the withheld heart. So sometimes we fall in love with somebody who doesn't uh, give us love back. And that happens to people. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. And this is, uh, I love Edward Hopper's work, the painter, Edward Hopper. And he always seems to paint, he always seemed to paint women in different rooms. And so I was in Cuba, uh, again, uh, at a workshop and this young ballerina was laying on this bed and I just thought, oh, it's Edward Hopper's bedroom. And here's another friend in Mexico who is gay and he hides it because his family wouldn't accept it. So I photographed him in light and shadow. Uh, so the shadow part is his secret and there's some lilies there, but he was, he's so lovely. And this is the man who lives in the forest and it's during COVID when everybody had to wear masks. So that's his mask. And this is the night spirit in the garden. And this is called day and night. And this is the man, the dark figure going into the water. And this, now you're gonna see some pictures that are a bit um, difficult and I hope nobody will be upset by them. Uh, I have a dark side, uh, I think, because of all of the dark things I've seen, but I also have a very light side and playful side. So, but anyway, but this is the dangerous woman. She's a friend of mine and she could look really dangerous. So 
I was in uh, I was in New Orleans and I saw this hotel and I thought, oh, it looks like it was closed and but it looks like it's haunted. So I photographed this this and uh, and this is called anything can happen because um, I when I take a bath I always keep a camera or my phone iPhone close by and because the light was beautiful and there were these shadows and my nails my toenails were painted and and this little drop of water fell down and popped back up I don't know if you can see it and it reflects too but it was like a miracle and somehow I caught it so that's anything can happen if you can if that can happen anything can happen okay so sorry I loved pulp fiction and I wanted to make a picture that was about pulp fiction, you know? So this is one of my best friends and she's she's an actress and she lets me do anything with her. And uh, so there's, <laughs> and this is the suitcase murder. And <laughs> so I was uh, in Istanbul teaching a workshop and these were some friends and they agreed to do this. So that's the suitcase murder. And this is the, um, this is the dangerous figure. And this is a, a photograph of every everybody's nightmare. Oh, and so <laughs> I went to a place where there was some burlesque and this naughty old man was trying to photograph this woman's breast. And I thought, well, I don't know, but okay. This is called waiting. And this is another version of the suitcase murder. And when I did a story, the story for National Geographic on memory loss, um, I wanted to show what happens to the brain. And so there are brain, brain banks all over this country, but try to get them to cut a slice of a brain for you. And uh, finally UCLA in Los Angeles, agreed to do it. And so I spent eight hours photographing these brain parts and with plexiglass and lights and different colors and everything. But at the end of the day, the doctor came in and he said, well, uh, you, you have to give me the brains back. And I was so attached to the brains by then. I thought, really? And he said, yes. And so he put on these gloves to kind of do something with them and I thought oh it looks like Hannibal Lecter in the silence of the lambs or something and this is the heart of a shark and that's nothing this is the dangerous figure and that's it but um there's more aspects to the secret garden and I guess I'll stop sharing the screen um Oh no, I don't want to do that. Oh, I don't want to do that. Stop share. Okay. So, sorry, I hope I'm not keeping you too long, but um, um, there's much more to the secret garden, but how much can you take? But I have so much fun with the secret garden. There's even a dead lizard's army, but I'm not going to show you that, but uh, I'll just tell you quickly. I have cats. I have a garden. There's lots of lizards here in Miami, little lizards, and I have cats. And Sadly, sometimes the cats kill the little lizards, which breaks my heart because I love them. And so I would started collecting them. And I thought, I don't know why I'm doing this, but there must be a reason. And I thought maybe I'm going to do something scientific with it or something. And uh, sometimes the lizard would get in the house and I didn't find them and I would find their little bodies. But um, anyway, I started collecting them. And I decided that the lizards could represent a second chance at life. And so I started making these little scenarios. So um, there's weddings, they, there's a king, there's a queen, there's a princess, they can have sex <laughs> on the sex bed. Okay, you're never gonna, it's beautiful. It, you, it's beautiful. And there's an army, there's a, a navy and there's a, not an airport, uh, yeah, all of that. So I make a lot of images with that. Just, I make these little scenarios and I have all kinds of things and that's so much fun as well. 
So in my um, in my freezer, I have about a hundred foil wrapped dead lizards and a bottle of vodka. That's the only thing I have in my freezer is all of these and a bottle of vodka in case they want to have a party. But I just think it's so sad when the kitties do that to them and I just want to give them a second chance at life. And it's so much fun to, it exercises my imagination and I think it's good for me. And I always have had a lively imagination um, and it's just so much fun. And so the Secret Garden of Lily La Palma is ongoing. And I recently published a book with some of the pictures called Anything Can Happen, but it's very dark. And I even wrote a little mystery story at the end. So that just came out. But everybody keeps asking me when I'm gonna have a book of The Secret Garden. And I say, I'm not in any hurry. So I'm having too much fun. Anyway, that's it. Uh, well, Maggie, there... that was all really uh, inspiring and uh, wonderful <laughs> and frightening at the same time. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And I'm yeah. sure that we have questions. I'm sure that there's people who are dying to ask a question. Well, I I don't have a question, but I I uh, wanted to say I don't, I don't think I've ever seen such a uh, uh, presentation of stunning photographs that were so moving. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Well, Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I, would, I, would I just wanted to say that um, that was extremely emotional and um, really touching. Um, and I, I enjoyed it. And it was uh, it touched on a lot of things that um, brought memories back for me, too. And it was it was very lovely and beautiful. And I'm so glad I watched tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. I very, very much appreciate it. What I really enjoyed about this, Maggie, is that that the way you've incorporated the dark, for example, all the Haiti stuff and the willingness to see the underside, as well as the beautiful faces and so on, and, and your mother's decline, and to see the positive and the negative, it, I just wondered... You, you you almost sound like a Balinese person or something, or they incorporate the, the dark and the light so beautifully. I appreciate that a lot. Oh, thank you. But you know that jo jo Joanne, Johan, Joanne. Johanna. Jo Johanna, sorry, yeah, there it is. Um, but that is like life, isn't it? There's beautiful bright moments and there's some dark ones. And we just have to find a way to balance them. And hopefully the bright ones will, uh, will there'll be more bright ones than dark ones, but there is darkness and, you know, we have to find a way to deal with it as best we can. Yeah. Can I be heard? I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm not a Zoom person, so I'm coming through. I just yes. want to say, I think that you are remarkable. And it's been so uh, inspirational and wonderful hanging out with you and how you <laughs> can go into dark sides. And yet you're like an eight-year-old girl playing mm -hmm. like in a puddle or something at the same time. I <laughs> <laughs> the only technical I thing <laughs> that I'd want to ask is that I guess with, as, as uh, doing photojournalism, you have to just quickly grab an image when it's there. Mm -hmm. And I get that. Um, but there are some images, for instance, uh, the guy crying out at his mother's funeral. I was kind of holding up my hands and think there could be a very powerful, closer cropped image. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, interesting I've... little side images. And I'm wondering if, if, if that must be something that you do on purpose. I don't, I don't have the question, but you know what I'm saying? It's like rather than going for this very powerful, tighter image, you show some of the little side faces that are also kind of interesting. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Or do you know what I'm saying? Well, I was lucky to get that shot because, again, it's, the, it's film. And uh, I think when something happens, you, you just go for it. And... You don't always have time to think or time to even do like both. 
I understand cropping it. Later in the dark room could, I mean, did you, did it go to a dark room where you could compose it in a dark room or you just have to send out the film? No, well, my boy, longtime boyfriend, who I'm not with anymore, but he also was a photographer. So we always had a dark room, but um, now I just, I don't have a dark room. So, but I never thought to, uh, I never thought to do that, to crop it, but actually the cover of my book on Haiti, it is cropped. That picture is the cover and mm -hmm. it is cropped vertically. So yeah, it works still, but I like having, I mean, you, 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 I kind of feel like you have to see the people holding him because he was in such, he was so heartbroken. And my but, thought was him and those people, but mm -hmm. then a couple of little faces in the corner off to the right and a couple in the back. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just wondering about that choice, mm -hmm. you know? Um, well, yeah, I'll have a look at it because I've, I'm so used to seeing it <laughs> the way that I showed it, but I'll have a look at that because I, I'm open to, yes, I'm open to all kinds of things. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Maggie, oh, I vote um, against it. I vote against it. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> uh, Maggie. I uh, I came across a quote recently. I don't know where I heard him. I even heard it through our uh, forum. But uh, where the needs of the world intersect with your talents, there lies your purpose. Oh, that's beautiful. Wonderful quote. And I think uh, that I think it's unattributed. I I couldn't find when I saw the quote. I couldn't find who who originally uh, had that thought, but um, you are the embodiment of that quote. You're such a brave uh, human to put yourself you know, out there. Um, you, and you just seem to have this keen understanding of the world outside of yourself, which is such a rare thing. And, um, you know, you've really found your purpose, as the quote implies. And I just want to congratulate you for a remarkable life and what you've done with it. Oh, so, thank you, thank Pat. You. I, I have a life I never expected to have. Um, and I love being a photographer. And the pictures, of course, are important. But I think what's much more important is that people let me photograph them. I really like people and they have stories. Everybody has a story. And the fact that we have to so admire and be grateful that people let us come into their lives to tell their story. It's their story. And uh, when they share it, it's such a privilege. It's really a gift. And thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to remember thank that. You. Thank you. Maggie. I wanted to thank you for done. <laughs> coming, doing this talk. Um, I've taken two workshops with you and they're just so inspiring and you're just so much full of love and you're so generous with your knowledge and your time. And I was just wondering if you're doing any more workshops because it's, they just, I come back so changed. Oh, uh, actually next at the end of next week, I'm going to New York to teach a workshop at with the graduating students at the International Center for Photography. It's a workshop I've taught for 15 years, and they come. It's so sad. They they come in like this. Oh, they've been going through. The, there's a lot of different teachers, and they, you know, they have to do a project, their graduating project, and. Uh, they get batted around and, you know, the teacher says, this is no good. And they take it out and the, and the edits are always changing. And so when they come in, I write an email to all of them and I say, bring everything. Let's look through everything. And they come in and we do it together. And by the time it's over and I teach them also how to work in this business and nobody does that. Very few people will share that because a lot of people who teach are photographers and they don't they don't want to share uh, how you get ahead. And I think, well, why not? You know, I mean, and so so they come in like this 
and they leave like this. I'm not kidding. It's so darling to see it. And uh, sometimes I find um, somebody's work that's really, really remarkable and I stay in touch with them. And I've on uh, several occasions, I've helped them get it published. And uh, I mentor a lot of people. I don't charge for that. Uh, and uh, it's 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 kind of wonderful if you can help uplift people and or lift people up and uh, and when you can help them get published, it's mm -hmm. it's as joyful a thing for me as much as if it was my work getting published. And I just think, why not? You know, why not? It's it's so much fun, and why not? Yeah, yeah. you're awesome to work with because you've always kept in touch all these yes. years. Yes, touch and I'm so glad great. too. Yeah, Don, I it's I I adore you, and she's wonderful, and um, just wonderful. And uh, oh, so I'm teaching that, but we're talking about teaching a secret garden workshop again with Carrie Payne. At her, at her beautiful estate. It's uh, in um, Maine and near Portland. And she has this beautiful place and it's a lot of, there's it, there's a woods, there's a lake. Um, it's quite lovely. And uh, now she has a bunch of um, trees that have a lot of flowers on them. So that's nice. And now there's some ducks as well. Well, there were always ducks because of the lake. But anyway, we have so much fun. And uh, yeah. it's nothing like my documentary work. But yeah. it, well, it's, it's a great workshop there. It, it is. Uh, the, the, the grounds are beautiful. The buildings are beautiful. The props are beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing experience to go there. It's just gorgeous. And so, yeah, it's cool that you're doing another one. Yeah, and we get to eat yummy things. <laughs> we get to eat <laughs> yes. yummy things. <laughs> yes. uh, are there other questions? I just have a quick one. First of all, Maggie, thank you so much. I I love um I love your sense of humor in addition to everything everyone else has said. But I wanted to ask you, do you you mentioned at one point asking people permission to take their photos. Do you try to make that a habit? Well, yes, I, I try to make it a habit. Now, sometimes I'll, something is happening in front of you. I mean, if it's a, if it's a riot or something like that, I don't, I don't, I'm just photographing it, but I almost always ask if it's something that's very uh, small or, you know, like if two lovers are on the bar, the park bench or something, I, I would ask. But I think uh, I try to always ask if I can, yeah. I I think um, what I've found, uh, I watch sometimes when I'm in a place where I'm teaching a workshop, but out in the open, I, I sometimes see tourists photographing people, but with a long lens. And I always want to go up to them and, well, like in uh, in Oaxaca, okay, Oaxaca, Mexico. It is such a beautiful city, and, and you know, and uh, and I saw this man photographing this little lady who was sitting on the curb, and she was selling flowers. And I wanted to go and say to him, you know, you'll get a much pic better picture if you go sit down and talk to her a little bit because she might even invite you home to meet her family and you can photograph the whole family. But I realized that he was with a group of people and he, he probably was too shy or maybe he didn't speak Spanish. And um, I understand why sometimes people don't, but I, I like to talk to people and uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to, to, to talk to people, but, I just put on that, okay, the brave Maggie <laughs> uh, cloak and I'll just go start talking to them. And and it's amazing what a difference it makes, but uh, you know, to each their own, I guess. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank I you appreciate for that.
Very kind words. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? If not, well, Maggie, thanks so much for 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 speaking to us tonight. Uh, I think your pictures were really moving. Like I say, wonderful and frightening at the same time. And I I think most most people would rather not see Haiti. And I think it's so important that we're aware of mm -hmm. horrific things that go on in the world, uh, at least to acknowledge it. It's something that we can't control it and there's nothing we can do about it, but we have to acknowledge it if nothing else, I think. Yes, I, I think so as well. But um, well, but you've been a lovely audience and I really appreciate it. And Don, thank you so much for making this happen. And uh, I wish we had time to look at your pictures. I mean, all of your pictures, maybe another- well we we have a uh, a photo challenge uh, that we're going to play here. It's about eleven minutes long, and you're welcome to stay. So this month's photo challenge was called Visual Poetry, and uh, it, it follows on the theme uh, at the Oregon Society of Artists this month. We have a uh, a photo exhibit where uh, most of the participants are PPF members. So we asked everybody to submit their two uh, photos from the gallery for our slideshow tonight. Oh, um, I would love to stay and see them if that's all right, because uh, just to say this um, quickly, and that is that I love all kinds of photography. If you saw my library of photography books, I recently gave a hundred away <laughs> because I have too many, but I like all kinds of photography and I think we can be inspired by all kinds of things and how people see the world is so fascinating. So I'd love to stay if it's okay. Okay, no, wonderful. Let me see if I can do the screen share and if I can queue up the slideshow here. Okay, do it. Oh, I don't have to do anything. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Okay, and we should have sound with it too, hopefully.
Thanks everyone who uh, submitted photos for the photo challenge and thanks for everybody who stayed on to watch till the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for Maggie to coming for coming and speaking to us. Thank you. May I say something? All of yeah. those pictures were wonderful. Really, I'm not kidding. I'm not just saying that. I I couldn't make some of those pictures. I I I couldn't, but and they're beautiful. They're beautiful, really. Well, thank you. Thank really you. Really, not just saying that. They're really have, beautiful. We we have a lot of very uh, talented and inspired members. And, yes, uh, yes. Uh, and it always surprises me the variety and the the imagination and creativity. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I I understand why sometimes people do need a long lens <laughs> to get those birds flying by. Johanna, you had two beautiful birds, bird pictures. Thank you so much, Maggie. They're, everything was beautiful. It's so nice to see the world and the earth and the beauty of that. And some of the things were very, were, had like a little limp, wink of the eye too. And it's lovely, really. Beautiful. You all are serious. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, well, thanks everyone for staying on till the end, and uh, we'll uh, end it here. And uh, hope to see everybody again next month. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Good night, thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.